the Mayan people have inhabited the areas of Guatemala and eastern Mexico for millennia. The Mayans are really many different peoples who historically share a similar language, cultural practices, and religious beliefs. Among their many achievements were an advanced calendar and great cities such as Chichen Itza and Tikal. Even after their golden age at the turn of the first millennium AD, the various Mayan groups continued to thrive until the arrival of the Spanish in 1519. Decimated by disease and persecution, the Mayan people nevertheless endured. Many cling to their traditional ways of life in rural towns and villages across Central America to this day. However, in the second half of the 20th century, the Mayans faced a new threat. A wave of persecution, oppression, and outright massacres that killed tens of thousands of people. The Guatemalan genocide, sometimes called the Silent Holocaust, is regularly forgotten by the rest of the world, but not by those who survived it and continue to live with its diabolical legacy. Today on A Day in History, we describe the harrowing events of the often forgotten Guatemalan genocide. If you appreciate videos like this, you can support us by liking the video and subscribing to our channel. The roots of the genocide were deep and varied, although two factors stick out. Firstly, there were the racist views towards the Mayans. Since the beginning of the colonial period, the Mayans had been ostracized by the European-descended Guatemalan elites. Living mostly in their isolated rural villages, the Mayans were seen as a foreign people within Guatemala's own borders, speaking their strange language and running their own affairs. Indigenous people were all but excluded from the halls of power. The intensely Catholic Guatemalan authorities saw the Mayan religion as subversive and paganistic, something that needed to be rooted out. And while the vast majority of Mayans were Catholic by the 1950s, some were not, and pre-Christian practices still lingered even in the Christian Mayan communities. Of course, the Mayans were also seen as racially inferior, less intelligent, less honest, and less capable than the Europeans. Chillingly, as late as the 1970s, one study estimated that 5 to 10 percent of Guatemalans supported ethnic cleansing of the Mayans to purify Guatemala. With such hostile and dehumanizing views towards the Mayans, perhaps it is no surprise that things turned out as they did. The other crucial factor leading to the genocide was the Cold War. Like many Central American countries, Guatemala was torn between powerful U.S.-aligned business interests and strong revolutionary communist and socialist groups among the general populace. Guatemala had been pushed and pulled between the extremes for decades. U.S.-based companies, particularly fruit companies, had meddled in political affairs for decades and multiple governments attempted to curtail the influence of foreign businesses. In 1954, when Jacobo Arbenz attempted to buy unused land from the fruit companies to redistribute to Guatemalan peasants, the U.S. saw this as a shift towards communism. The CIA spearheaded a coup that toppled Arbenz and installed a series of U.S.-backed dictatorships. The dictatorships proved unstable and unpopular. For example, the initial dictator Carlos Castillo Armaz was assassinated by his own bodyguard in 1957. However, the U.S. was satisfied so long as the Guatemalans maintained a strong anti-communist posture. In 1960, the new dictator, Miguel Idogaros Fuentes, agreed to provide Guatemalan airfields and soldiers for the proposed Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba. This was too far. In the same year, a third of the Guatemalan military revolted under the leadership of leftist officers, sparking a civil war that would last for 36 years. The rebels melted away into the countryside and became a guerrilla force. In the following years, Guatemala went through several governments while it waged a constant war against these guerrillas. Hiding in the countryside, the guerrillas found natural allies in the indigenous Mayan communities. Like the leftist rebels, the Mayans were no fans of the Guatemalan government. The Mayan rural communities also tended to be organized in ways that resembled the worker cooperatives idealized by the leftists. Before long, many Mayan communities began adopting leftist ideas of labor organization inspired by the rebels, and many Mayans joined the rebel groups. Throughout the 1960s and early 1970s, Mayan and leftist groups became closely tied. This, of course, did not go unnoticed by the Guatemalan government. 
with xenophobia and racism now mingled with virulent anti-communism and a fear of rebellion, the Guatemalan government had every motivation to unleash violence on the indigenous people of Guatemala. Although the Guatemalan Civil War began in 1960, the first decade and a half saw only sporadic fighting. While the guerrillas were a constant menace to the government, there was no real risk of them overthrowing the state. In contrast, the Guatemalan military, supported with equipment and training from the US, was arguably the best military force in Central America. Still, the seeds of the genocide were already being planted. By the mid-1960s, the Guatemalan government was sending out death squads into the countryside to hunt down groups of guerrilla fighters. The most infamous of these was Mano Blanca, or White Hand, which was described as a sort of Guatemalan Gestapo. They were backed by the CIA, who were responsible for the kidnapping, assassination, and execution of guerrillas and troublesome leftist activists. In November 1966, the government declared a state of siege and suspended the constitution, effectively ending human rights so that they could deal with the guerrillas more brutally. By late 1966, the Guatemalan regime launched a massive anti-guerrilla campaign in the Zacapa region, led by Colonel Arana Osorio. Zacapa was heavily populated by Mayans, who inevitably faced the brunt of the campaign. While guerrilla fighters were present, most people in the region were simple farmers who wanted to be left alone. The arrival of government forces brought theft, intimidation, rape, and in many cases, murder. Collateral damage from the army's campaign inevitably took the lives of civilians. The Zacapa campaign also further convinced the government of the close ties between Mayans and their leftist enemies. Some of the first massacres of Mayan civilians occurred in Zacapa as a result. Villages suspected of rebel sympathies were disappeared or simply massacred on the spot. By 1968, as many as 8,000 people had been killed by the government in the Zacapa region, many of them civilians, earning Colonel Osorio the nickname of the Butcher of Zacapa. Fighting eased going into the 1970s, but cycles of violence and retaliation continued. In 1975, communist guerrillas killed a landowner, Jose Luis Arenas. In response, the government cracked down on a Mayan worker cooperative in the nearby town of Ishkan Grande. Thirty men were disappeared, never to be seen again. There was no confirmed link between these guerrillas and the villagers. To the government, fighting communists and fighting Mayans had become essentially the same thing. Realizing their situation, the Mayans tried to organize in 1978 with the foundation of Comité de Unidad Campesina, CUC, or Committee for Peasant Unity in English. The CUC brought together numerous smaller indigenous and labor groups to form the first large indigenous-led labor organization. To its supporters, it was a necessary evolution to combine the strength of a persecuted minority with political organization. The CUC marched publicly for the first time in the capital in May 1978, a powerful symbol of political defiance. For the Guatemalan government, however, it was a confirmation of everything they had feared. The CUC represented the inseparability of Mayans from the government's political enemies, and in the coming years, the Mayans would pay the price. Most scholars place the start of the genocide in 1978. Specifically, they point to the 29th of May, 1978 mere weeks after the CUC's first march, and to the massacre at Panzos. On that morning, hundreds of civilians from nearby villages gathered in Panzos. They were protesting for land rights and against the abuses of local civil and military officials. There was no evidence that leftist groups or the CUC was involved, and this was probably a spontaneous local event. Some of the protesters brought farming equipment and machetes, but no firearms. Some say that members of the crowd began pushing soldiers, while others insist that the soldiers, seeing the crowd of peasants before them, simply raised their guns and opened fire. A handful of soldiers were injured as the crowd fought back, but the civilians were no match for the military. In a mere five minutes, 50 people were dead in the town square, all of them civilians, and many of them women and children. <laughs> 
Later, the soldiers claimed that the protesters had guns, although none of these guns were ever found and no soldiers suffered any bullet wounds. Things only got worse in July 1978 when a new government under General Romeo Lucas Garcia took power. Garcia effectively declared war on rural labor and indigenous movements. Countless leaders of these groups were hunted down and kidnapped. Most would never be seen again. Those who did turn up again did so hanging from trees or floating face down in a river. By late 1979, Garcia had purged 8,000 people. Pushed to the brink, indigenous activists took drastic measures. In January 1980, a group of students and Mayan farmers entered the Spanish embassy armed with guns and molotovs. Spain was known to be sympathetic to the plight of the indigenous people, and despite their weapons, the protesters were apparently respectful to the embassy staff. Soon the media descended on the embassy, and the Guatemalan government cracked down. Despite pleas from the Spanish ambassador that violence was unnecessary, the Guatemalan government decided to evict the protesters by force. They stormed the building and even used chemical weapons, notably white phosphorus, which ignited a fire. The fire consumed the whole building, killing all but one of the activists and many embassy staff, including one of the Spanish consuls. The only surviving activist was taken to hospital, only to be abducted by a group of armed men, tortured, and his dead body dumped on a campus at the University of San Carlos. The event horrified the world. Surviving Spanish embassy staff were appalled at the government's actions and Spain called it a violation of human rights and severed all diplomatic relations with the country. The embarrassed Guatemalan government only clamped down harder and by late 1980, massacres had become frequent in the countryside. In one typical massacre in July, 64 civilians from the Ishilmayan village of San Juan Cotzal were massacred by government forces. Another massacre at the village of Kokob in April 1981 killed 65 civilians, including 34 children. Garcia's regime launched an all-out offensive in the countryside in July 1981 under the codename Ashes 81. Ostensibly, it was still an anti-leftist campaign, but in reality, it was just as much an indigenous purge. Led by Garcia's own brother, the Guatemalan operation swept from the Pacific coast and moved inland, systematically hunting down all traces of organized resistance and regularly massacring the scattered and defenseless Mayan villages. Any and all involvement with leftist groups earned a death sentence. The Mayan activist Rigoberta Menjú described how her brother, who had worked as a secretary for the local village cooperative, was kidnapped and tortured for weeks. His family was then summoned to a nearby town where the local military officer lectured them on the evils of disloyalty before burning her brother and several other alleged rebels alive in the town square. Ashes 81 especially targeted the CUC and nearly all of its founding members were dead by the end of the year. One of the only ways for mines to escape the massacres was to participate in them. The government began arming rural militias under tight military supervision to take part in the counterinsurgency. Many joined up willingly, while others were forced to participate at gunpoint. In a grim us-or-them bargain, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of Mayans were recruited into temporary death squads and roamed the countryside in search of enemies. These militias proved remarkably effective. In a mere two months, these militias were mostly responsible for killing around 10% of the population of the Rabanal region. Nearly all of them were Mayans. The guerrillas tried to mount a defense, but they were vastly outnumbered, and even a victory on the battlefield could have dire consequences. In February 1982, guerrillas mounted a bitter defense of the village of Shishis, costing the army around 100 casualties before withdrawing. Enraged, the army let their frustration out on the Mayans, killing all 200 civilians left in the village. Perhaps the most famous massacre occurred at the village of Don Erez in December 1982. A few weeks earlier, guerrillas had ambushed a convoy nearby and killed 21 soldiers. The army decided to use Don Erez as an example in response. In the early hours of the 4th of December, soldiers swept into the village, roused people from their beds and marched them to the village church. Then, they beat 
hung, raped, and shot their way through the villages. For four days, the soldiers inflicted horrors upon the population. Children had their skulls crushed, women were brutally raped, while others were shot in the head and left lying in the street. By the morning of the 8th of December, 226 people lay dead. A tiny handful of villagers managed to slip away into the jungle, the last witnesses to everything that transpired. The overthrow of Garcia's government in March 1982 merely inaugurated a new regime of terror, that of Brigadier General Rios Montt. The violence continued uninterrupted. By early 1983, the government was killing around 200 people a day and 5,000 refugees were pouring over the Mexican border every week. The people of Guatemala and of the world knew what was happening, but were powerless to stop it. Even Rios Montt's own brother, a Catholic priest, used his platform to condemn his brother's policies. Violence peaked in 1983, but gradually declined afterwards. Sporadic violence did occur through the late 80s and early 90s, but not at the rates or scale of earlier years. The Guatemalan Civil War officially ended in 1996, and only then could survivors and observers begin to piece together the true extent of what happened. The UN was quick to launch an investigation. International journalists and filmmakers took an interest, and indigenous activists played a leading role in campaigning for awareness and accountability for the horrors inflicted on their communities. The UN report in 1999 determined that 200,000 people had been killed since 1960, the vast majority of them being Mayan civilians. They identified no fewer than 669 mass killings, over 90% of which were performed by the Guatemalan government. Inevitably, most of the people involved faced no consequences for their crimes. Nevertheless, activists and international organizations have managed to get scrapes of justice. In 2015, police chief Pedro Garcia Arredondo, who commanded the destruction of the Spanish embassy, was sentenced to 90 years in prison. In 2011, four of the soldiers involved in the infamous Don Erez massacre were each given over 6,000 years in prison, a sentence that was repeated for two more soldiers in 2012 and 2018. Several other officers and high officials have been charged in relation to the genocide. Most notably in 2013, former dictator Rios Montt was found guilty of genocide and crimes against humanity for the killing of thousands of Ishal Maya. However, the country's constitutional court overturned the verdict shortly after, and he was deemed mentally unfit for a retrial before his death in 2018. Despite the scale and recentness of the atrocities, the Guatemalan genocide is often forgotten by the rest of the world, perhaps because it was so drawn out, or because the genocide occurred in hundreds of scattered villages rather than in major cities or easily located death camps. Others suggest that Western audiences ignore it because of the US's role in propping up the governments that perpetrated it. Whatever the reasons, the silent holocaust of Guatemala's indigenous population is another atrocity lost amid the long list of horrors inflicted upon human beings in the 20th century. Its survivors still wrestle with its consequences, and the scars it left on Guatemala and its people will remain for years to come. At a day in history, we think it's important to remember events like this. If you agree with us and you want to support us in that mission, please help us out by liking this video and subscribing to our channel for more videos like this one.